Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the October session of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundations webinar series. My name is Kara Nelson. I'm a board member of the foundation. I'm also a professor of restoration ecology at University of Montana in Missoula. And before the seminar starts today, I wanted to share a few words about the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. Its mission is to promote the conservation of white bark pine and other high elevation five needle white pine ecosystems through education, restoration, management, and research. At the September webinar, Diana Tombak kicked off uh, the webinar session with information about the foundation's work on the National White Bark Restoration Plan. And today I wanna let you know about another of the foundation's programs, which is the Student Research Grant Program. So hopefully many of you are aware that the foundation gives an annual award of $1,000 to a student, an undergrad or a graduate student who is focusing their thesis research on white bark pine. The research could be on threats to white bark, including mountain pine beetle, blister rust, successional replacement, climate change, interactions with wildlife, such as Clark nutcrackers or other birds, squirrels, grizzly bears, restoration strategies for white bark pine, ecosystem level impacts, white bark pine die off, or social or policy aspects of white bark pine decline and restoration and wilderness issues. For 2023, we are also partnering with John Van Gundy to offer a second $1,000 scholarship for anyone who's doing research in white bark pine dynamics under climate change. The scholarship funding can be used for direct expenses things like traveling to a field site or consumable research expenses. In addition, the Van Gundy scholarship can also be used to support analysis. The application deadline is in February, so you have plenty of time to share this opportunity in your networks. If you're a student to consider applying and putting together your proposal, you can find the announcement in the next issue of Nutcracker Notes. The foundation, of course, is a membership-based organization composed of people who share a passion for white bark pine ecosystems. And the membership money, the donation money, goes to support the foundation's programs, including the work on the restoration plan and the student grant program. If you are not already a member, uh, please consider joining. And in just a couple of minutes, when I'm done speaking, I will put a link in the chat. So um, you can look at the website, look at all the other great programs the foundation is working on and click the link to support us. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Laurel. Thanks, Kara. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming. I'm Laurel Sindewal, a PhD candidate in Diana Tombak's Forest Ecology Lab at CU Denver. I'm co-organizing this webinar with Tio Rautu, a master's student in Dan Danielle Ulrich's lab at Montana State University, and Vlad Kovalenko, a master's student in Diana Six's lab at University of Montana. Welcome to the second webinar installment of 2022. If you missed the first installment with Jeremy Johnson from Michigan State University, you can find recordings of the talks on our YouTube channel. I'll, the link for that is, and for our website, is in the chat. There. <laughs> Today's speaker is Thomas McLaren, who recently started a new position working as a biologist with the Klamath Bird Observatory in Ashland, Oregon. After graduating with his Master's of Science degree from the University of Colorado, Denver, while working in Diana Tombak's Forest Ecology Lab. Tommy McLaren graduated with his Bachelor's of Science degree in Fish and Wildlife Management from Montana State University in 2013. Since then, his work has taken him across the Western United States to areas including Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, and Oregon. During that time, his work has focused on the intersection of conservation and research as it relates to conifer forests, sagebrush, and grassland ecosystems. Specifically, Tommy has had the chance to work in several national parks and monuments, such as Saguaro, Yellowstone, and Grand Teton as a seasonal biological technician. 
During that time, he was involved in projects including sagebrush restoration, native plant community monitoring, mountain red fox tracking, and nesting raptor surveys. Additionally, Tommy spent time working with avian conservation groups, including Teton Raptor Center and Bird, Con and Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, performing monitoring and, field and research fieldwork. Tommy's research interests involve understanding wildlife habitat relationships, particularly in relation to variable food resources, and leveraging statistical models to more fully understand the process by which ecological data are generated. In his free time, Tommy enjoys rock climbing, birding, and generally wandering in the woods. In particular, he enjoys hiking in the mountains and looks forward to exploring Oregon and the region around Ashland. Today, Tommy is here to talk about his research on Clark's Nutcracker seed harvesting habitat use in Yellowstone National Park over three years of variation in annual cone production. In addition to producing a model for Nutcracker habitat use, he is conducting a statistical analysis of the existing Nutcracker monitoring program in Yellowstone to assess its ability to detect a decline in Nutcracker population over time. If you have questions following Tommy's talk, we encourage you to virtually raise your hand so that we can enable you to unmute yourself and start a dialogue. If you are un unable to do so, you may put your questions in the chat and I will read them. With that, I'll turn it over to Tommy. Thank you. Thanks, Laurel. I really appreciate the introduction. Okay, let me get this pulled up. Okay, can you see this all right? Yes. All right, thanks. Great, so yeah, I'm very excited to be here with you all and uh, generally to talk birds and nutcrackers and white bark pine, uh, as well as other conifers, as you'll see. So my presentation is titled Clark's Nutcracker Conifer Seed Resource Use in Yellowstone National Park. I'm Tom McLaren, uh, currently a biologist with the Klamath Bird Observatory. I want to recognize Diana Tomback, Michael Wonder, Walter Wedgie, and Nels Grevstad, who were my committee members. Uh, this presentation actually uh, summarizes my thesis research at, uh, at uh, University of Colorado, Denver. I also want to thank uh, Doug Smith and Lauren Walker, who uh, were or are uh, Yellowstone National Park biologists while we were conducting this work, uh, their, their support was uh, hugely impactful. So I was always taught to start with my acknowledgements uh, to make sure that they're, uh, they aren't rushed at the end and give everyone due credit. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank my fiance, Thea Doyon for all of her support, as well as my advising committee and Anyone and everyone who came out and provided field assistance, this was definitely uh, a work, a, a project of many hands. Uh, so all of the folks here contributed really meaningful work. I also wanna thank Ricketts Conservation Foundation and Yellowstone Center for Resources for their support along the way. And my former lab mate, mates, including Andres Andrade, uh, Libby Pansing, Laurel Sindewald, who you just heard from, uh, Tara Derbera and uh, Blair Caldwell. So uh, today I'm gonna split this into th roughly three parts. I wanna begin with the introduction to Clark's Nutcracker Ecology as it relates to seed resource use. And then I wanna transition into our directed research uh, beginning with Clark's Nutcracker seed harvesting in Yellowstone National Park. And then uh, the third part is gonna be uh, a, a quick overview of a power analysis that we conducted to determine whether a long-term monitoring protocol uh, could, be a, uh, could be continued from the study that we established. <clears throat> so I'll start with a bit of background. Clark's Nutcracker is a corvid songbird, species named Nucifrega columbiana. They're well known for their role as a uh, seed disperser in many uh, Western conifer uh, forests. And they are particularly notable for their harvesting and caching of tens of thousands of seeds each fall for later consumption during the winter and early springtime. 
Uh, but their seed resource use varies uh, pretty widely depending on the area of the species range that you're concerned with uh, and the local availability of conifer species. For reference, or I guess for an introduction to that, on the right here, you can see a quick review of some of the studies that have uh, focused on nutcracker seed resource use in various parts of their species range and the conifer species that were observed to be used. Uh, this is definitely not comprehensive, but it does give you an idea of that variability, particularly as we move between uh, the Rocky Mountains and the coastal Cascade or Sierra Nevada ranges, uh, you can see several different species listed. And of course, white bark does show up quite a bit on that list. So uh, how and why are they using these seeds? Well, um, beginning in the top left here, we can kind of work through their annual cycle. And so in late spring and early summer, nutcrackers are uh, subsistence uh, foraging on opportunistic food resources. Uh, uh, a wide variety of things have been observed, even including things like roadkill, uh, lizards, insects, uh, remaining uh, seed caches from the previous year, et cetera. Uh, as we move into summer, we begin to see the conifer cones of that year ripening and nutcrackers begin uh, sort of a routine uh, checking and harvesting of various conifer stands to uh, either uh, consume or cache seeds from that year's uh, 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 cone crop, essentially. So they continue that through the uh, harvesting season and into October, where we move down into the bottom right, uh, where they're continuing to cache seeds that are remaining, which may involve uh, transitioning between different conifer species, which may ripen at different times. And they start looking for nesting sites uh, uh, later in the fall and early winter. Uh, one notable aspect of their life cycle is that nutcrackers uh, nest quite a bit earlier than many other songbird species, in part due to their ability to retrieve these cached seeds that they've, uh, they've put out on the landscape in the previous uh, fall that allows them to have a reli reliable seed resource use or a reliable seed resource that they can feed uh, their brood with. And so they, uh, in late winter and early spring, are nesting and they are using those seeds that they've cached and uh, any remaining seeds that may be on the landscape. And that brings us back around to spring as they deplete those seed resources and forage more opportunistically. <clears throat> so to dive back into the different species that they're known to use. We've got, again, a non-comprehensive list here, but I did wanna highlight uh, three species that they have been documented using that do occur in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. These are white bark pine, Douglas fir, and limber pine. So we wanna transition briefly over to white bark. Uh, and talk about the mutualism here. Of course, white bark has codes, cones that are notable for remaining closed even when ripe. Uh, and so this uh, adaptation prevents, <clears throat> um, ooh, that's a great question. I would love to get to that question at the end here. Um, I'll save it for the end though. Uh, so, uh, white bark and, uh, sorry, got a little, a little off topic there. Uh, so white bark has um, cones that remain closed and nutcrackers due to several adaptations are one of the few species that are able to actually dig into those cones and retrieve those seeds. And of course, due to this, uh, this harvesting and caching behavior that they have in the fall, um, those seeds get dispersed widely across the landscape 
And if those seeds aren't retrieved in the, uh, in the following winter breeding season, they can then, uh, they can germinate and contribute to forest regeneration uh, of white bark. And so both species in this case do benefit, nutcrackers have a rel reliable uh, seed resource that actually ripens uh, maybe slightly earlier than some of the other conifer species. And uh, white bark, on the other hand, has a uh, seed dispersal mechanism. Unfortunately, of course, white bark is under threat from several uh, fronts, but the one I want to focus on here is white pine blister rust, an introduced fungal pathogen uh, that affects not only white bark pine, but uh, many other white pine species, particularly across uh, Western North America. And this fungal pathogen, when it infects limbs of a host tree, will tend to reduce the cone production of that tree and uh, on that, that infected limb and eventually can uh, kill the host tree. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see some results from long term monitoring in the Greater Yellowstone for blister rust. This was conducted by the Greater Yellowstone White Park uh, Monitoring Group. Uh, let's see, uh, whose acronym escapes me at the moment. <laughs> um, great, so I'm gonna transition into our directed research here, focused on Clark's Nutcracker forest community used uh, during fall seed harvest in Yellowstone National Park. So here's a forest community map of Yellowstone that highlights the particular con uh, conifer communities that we were interested in. So in green, you can see white bark pine uh, located in the northwest corner of the park, as well as on the uh, eastern boundary in the Absorcas, and then uh, spread out along the southern boundary. Uh, in purple, you can see lodgepole pine, which clearly dominates the central part of the park. Uh, we have Engelmann spruce in this darker red, found in uh, mesic locations and uh, along stream sides and near lakes and water sources. In bright red, we have Douglas fir, uh, found commonly across the uh, the Lamar Valley at the northern end of the park, as well as the Blacktail Plateau. And then I've highlighted two sites where we located uh, mature stands of limber pine. The data source that we got this uh, spatial information from did not actually include limber pine, likely because it was not as widespread of a forest community type as some of these other species were. Um, but it does occur in at least some mature stands in the park. Uh, subalpine fir is also present in several of our forest community types, including Engelmann spruce and white bark pine. <clears throat> so for our methods, we uh, stratified by uh, forest community type in order to uh, have study sites in that spread of uh, forest communities that you saw on the last slide. And we uh, restricted our study sites to uh, be accessible from trails. We put in two to three study sites per forest community type. So five forest communities in all. And in total, we established 11 transects between 2019 and 2020. Uh, each of those transects, you can see an example on the right here was a one kilometer uh, line that had both uh, cone count points and uh, 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 distance sampling point count stations for nutcracker counts. Uh, so the cone counts you can see in red were uh, tagged trees where we counted the number of cones produced in that year and then performed repeated monthly ripeness checks. Uh, the blue points indicate five 15-minute uh, distance sampling point count stations. Each of these was 250 meters apart. 
And due to the, uh, the distance at which nutcrackers can be heard, we actually restricted our cues to just visual detections of the birds. Uh, each of our point counts was also divided into three uh, consecutive five minute time periods. So zero to five minutes, five to 10 and 10 to 15. And this follows what we call a removal design. So from uh, the first time period to the second and third, as we count birds, they're sort of removed from further consideration and there's fewer birds to count in later time periods. <clears throat> Finally, we established community assessment strip plots. Uh, these were anchored on one of the 11 cone count trees that was selected randomly, and they were to help characterize the uh, stem density of our stands and to get a better sense of the forest communities at each of our sites. Oops. Okay, so as far as cone ripening of these species goes, there's a, a bit of a, a progression here. Um, several of our species ripen earlier than others. So our white pines, white bark pine and limber pine tend to ripen slightly earlier than our other three species, uh, lodgepole pine, Engelmann spruce and Douglas fir. And in order to uh, capture the progression of uh, ripening across each uh, cone harvesting season, we had uh, repeated visits to our sites. So <clears throat> we had three time periods in which we surveyed, an early harvesting season time period, a mid harvesting season time period, and a late harvesting season time period. In early harvesting, uh, typically none of our, our conifer species had ripened entirely yet. Uh, the birds were definitely observed uh, using some seeds during this time, but they weren't, uh, they weren't like fully ready. During mid harvesting season, however, uh, particularly our white bark and limber pine uh, species were ready to go. They were fully ripened. And birds were hypothesized to use those, those areas more heavily at that time. Late harvesting season reflects the time period when uh, other conifer species may be ripening and could also have a, uh, a transition between conifer seed resource uses. So uh, three separate time periods that might reflect different uh, seed resource uses. So we have questions generally related to uh, conifers, and then we have nutcracker questions. So I'll start with the conifer questions, um, which were, uh, how do conifer cone production indexes in Yellowstone vary among species and also across years? And so we took a uh, model comparison approach to this. We used negative binomial regression to estimate mean cones per tree for each of our forest types within each of our years and compared sort of, uh, several competing models. So in this case, the sample unit would be a single tree. Now for our nutcracker related questions, we were interested in using abundance as a metric of habitat use. And we were uh, interested in how the different forest community types in Yellowstone are used by Clark's Nutcracker. And additionally, how do variables such as uh, survey timing, so that would be early, mid or late harvesting season, as well as calendar year and an index of cone energy from our sites impact uh, our estimates of Nutcracker abundance. And so um, to do that, we collected our point count survey data and performed what's called a hierarchical distance sampling analysis. Now, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna burden you with the math in the bottom right here. This is the equation for our distance sampling model, but I do wanna conceptually describe 
the rationale for having such a complicated model that we're using. So uh, as you can see in the bottom right, we start with essentially some point count data. And <clears throat> this data can be confounded by several factors, one of which is whether or not these highly mobile birds are even available to be counted during the time that we're surveying for them. Nutcrackers are moving to and from their caching sites and their harvesting sites routinely during this time period. And so they may be using a site, but they may not actually be there at the time. Um, additionally, uh, it's, it's pretty well documented that uh, even the most experienced of surveyors suffer from imperfect detectability. That is to say that there may be nutcrackers available to be detected while we're surveying, but just due to uh, site conditions, et cetera, an observer may fail to actually see those birds. And this can actually lead to an undercounting of the number of birds that were using a site at one time. Um, so what we can do is use a, a, bit, of, uh, a bit of math to uh, account for these things. And if we collect a bit more data, we can actually model these things directly and get at what we're really interested in, which is nutcracker abundance. Rather than like a relative abundance index, we're, uh, we're now able to uh, talk in terms of actual nutcracker abundance at our site. So visually, what, is this, what does this mean? Well, if you imagine a uh, study site like this one, there's seven birds using the site right now. And we put out a transect. And as we're surveying, these birds are moving around, uh, harvesting seeds and caching them. And so our, uh, our limited survey area may not capture all the birds that are actually using that site at the time that we survey. Uh, this is that availability process. And you can see the uh, equation for that on the right. And then additionally, uh, we used what's called distance sampling, a, uh, a common procedure in wildlife studies to estimate the detectability of these birds uh, during our surveys. And that's the equation at the bottom here. To give you a better idea of what distance sampling actually is, uh, I've got a little bit more here. So if you look in the top right, I've simulated some data and you can see, um, Basically, from the blue X, which would be the location of an observer, there are more green dots nearby that observer because those are our detected individuals. Those black dots are individuals that are present and available to be detected, but um, they're just not counted during a survey. Oops, did not mean to move past that. <clears throat> so you can see that there's a, uh, a deep a decline in the number of individuals that are detected as we move farther from the uh, observer. And in the bottom right, you can see what some of that data might look like in a histogram, where we have our high counts fairly close to the observer, and then a, uh, a drop off as we get farther and farther from that person, uh, just due to a decline in detectability. Essentially, with distance analysis, we can map one of these curves like you see in A, B, or C onto our data and find the one that best fits. And then we can uh, account for that imperfect detectability. <clears throat> so uh, to reiterate our variables of interest, we had forest community type, which was our stratifying variable. We had survey time period uh, or month, as you may see, and that was our uh, resurvey uh, design. Then we had survey year, that's just the calendar year, a cone crop energy index, which I'll show you on the next slide. And then to assess our grouping of these site community types, the forest community types, we also assessed whether uh, site ID could be a better explanatory variable. So just comparing our forest community groupings to each site gets its own uh, estimate of nutcracker abundance. So here's a bit about that energy index. 
<clears throat> what I what I did was I actually uh, performed a lit review and found information for each of our conifer species on mean seeds per cone, as well as the uh, estimated energy per seed for each of those species. And if you if you combine that information together, we get a kilojoules per cone value. You can see that it varies pretty widely for some of our species. Uh, limber pine was the highest here. White bark was second. Um, uh, and then we have lodgepole is essentially the, the lowest. Um, if we take these values and scale up our, uh, our values from our cone count data, we can get an estimated energy index for each site. And so that was how we computed that, that variable. And this really helps us get it at the question of uh, how sensitive to energy availability are nutcrackers. Um, does this index serve as a good way of uh, predicting nutcracker abundance at our sites? Uh, or is there maybe a different way of predicting nutcracker abundance that might be better? So we also assessed whether some variables might affect detectability of birds and availability. The number of the stem density was thought to be an important factor for detectability of birds. So as stems increase per, per unit area, uh, visibility really uh, drops off. Of course, I have some pictures of this in a little bit. I'll show you some of our sites. Um, but this was thought to negatively impact detectability. We also wanted to assess uh, observer ID. So maybe some ob observers are better at detecting nutcrackers than others. And then uh, we hypothesized that there might be some, uh, some ecological reasons why nutcrackers might change their behavior during different time periods and thus be more or less detectable. So that was also assessed. For availability, we used the five minute time periods to assess whether or not nutcrackers might be more or less available. Okay, on to our results, starting again with the cone count analysis. So there's a lot going on here. Um, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you can see our raw data mapped out in box plots. We have from left to right, white bark pine, lodgepole pine, Engelman spruce, limber pine, and Douglas fir. You can already see that there are some major differences between uh, some of our species. So white bark and lodgepole had routinely low uh, cones per tree observed, whereas there was much greater variability in Engelman spruce limber pine and Douglas fir. Uh, some, some of the trees that we counted had up to 800 cones and even a, a little bit above that. Um, so there's already some clear differences among conifer species, which it, of course is to be expected. Uh, interestingly though, there was an interaction between conifer species and calendar year, uh, sort of indicating that well, uh, cone, uh, cone production changed between years, as we might expect. Um, it didn't change in the same way for each of our species. So a year that uh, one species had a particularly high cone uh, production may not have related to other species. So what you can see on the right-hand side are the predicted cones per tree. Again, matching our raw data, uh, white bark and lodgepole had relatively low numbers of cones per tree across all three years. Uh, in Engelman spruce, we only were able to set up our, our uh, sites in 2020, so we didn't have data in 2019. Uh, those were fairly stable. However, for uh, limber pine and Douglas fir, there were uh, some, some significant differences between years. Well, I shouldn't say significant. There were some differences that we found between years and patterns that did not, uh, that didn't correlate between species. 
So from our community assessments, uh, you can see the DBH sized stems on the left hand side. These are the raw counts from our two community assessments. And you can see some clear patterns of difference among our conifer types again. So white bark, lodgepole, and Engelmann spruce have fairly dense forest stands, whereas limber pine and Douglas fir have uh, much, uh, much less dense uh, and much fewer DBH stems per unit area. So what this really shows me personally is that in some areas, we may not be able to see nutcrackers nearly as well as we would in areas that have very few trees and are very open like our limber pine and Douglas fir sites. Additionally, on the right, we uh, were able to produce some maps of our, uh, of our forest communities as they relate to uh, DBH size. And these really supported our designations of forest community type, which was, which was reassuring. So to give you a sense of what these sites look like and the differences among some of them, we have a Douglas fir site on the left here. This was taken, I think, in 2019 during October. So I think that was the one year we got snow during our surveys, actually. And you can see that there's a lot more visibility at that site than there is at our lodgepole or white bark pine sites, uh, where the number of stems really occludes visibility farther away. That lodgepole site, you, we're standing at the top of a hill there, so you can see a little bit farther, but down in the uh, flatter areas, visibility is a lot more uh, restricted. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to our nutcracker habitat use modeling. Uh, here is our raw distance sampling data on the left. This represents all three years of the survey that we performed. And you can clearly see that there's a decline, especially after about 40 meters or so. And so this would suggest that uh, distance sampling is a, is a a uh, reasonable approach in this situation. So we moved forwards with our distance sampling after seeing this. And <clears throat> what we did was we actually uh, compared models in two stages. So because there were several uh, components to each of these models that we were interested in, detectability of nutcrackers, availability, and then most particularly, nutcracker abundance, uh, we had a lot of what we might call moving parts. So there are lots of potential models when you combine all of our variables in different ways. And to reduce the number of models that we uh, compared, well, not um, reducing our, uh, our power of inference, we took a secondary submodels approach where we tried to model detectability, availability, and abundance uh, individually, and then combine the uh, best predictive models from each of those sets into a final model set. Uh, and so that final model set then lets us uh, evaluate which uh, variables and sets of variables are best at predicting nutcracker abundance and thus uh, making inferences about their habitat use. So from detectability, it was fairly clear that the DBH stem density was really important as a factor in uh, nutcracker detection. The two models that were moved on to the final stage both had this variable on their own, and they were just different shapes of a detection function hazard rate, and half normal. <clears throat> For availability, we uh, found that a time removal model did fit our data very well. And so that model was moved on. And then for abundance, uh, we had relatively uh, more uh, covariates and uh, interactions between covariates that we wanted to test for. And so there was a much larger model set than with our two other uh, processes. 
And so this was the final set of models that was moved on. Uh, in each case, we included forest type uh, as a covariate, except for a null model and a site ID model, uh, because forest type was really one of our uh, key variables of interest. And having stratified upon it, uh, it made sense to include it in the majority of models that we were testing. We also included site, or uh, we also included month and year. Again, month is that early, mid, or late harvesting season uh, revisitation. And uh, you can see that cones or that energy index was also included here. Okay, so uh, once all of these uh, models were combined, we ended up with a final model set. And so I apologize for uh, sort of a, a fairly dense table here, uh, but I'll try and sort of parse things out. And I really, for the rest of this, uh, this section, I'm just gonna focus on this top model. Although I do also want to show you that there were several other models that were competitive in this process. So on the left-hand side, you can actually see the uh, parameters that were included in the model. That first tilde and the first line represents the parameters for nutcracker abundance. So that top model has one parameter for each forest community type, as well as a parameter for each survey month or for uh, more specifically each harvesting period. It also had that time period removal process that I was talking about for availability. And it had uh, stem density for the detection process. So you can see that that's the uh, uh, model with the lowest AICC score that we were using to uh, weight and compare our models. Uh, just behind that though, there is a model that has uh, almost exactly the same structure without the uh, inclusion of uh, which harvesting period we were in. So I do wanna note that there's, there's a, a very close, those two models were very close when it came to their AICC scores. <clears throat> so how did uh, stem density affect detection? Well, on the left, you can see an interaction between the detection scale parameter, uh, sigma, which is just sort of that one term from a, a normal distribution, essentially, it's, uh, they're, they're related. Um, and the DBH stems uh, per 500 meter plot or the combined two plots for each transect. So with those blue lines indicating our 95% confidence intervals, you can see that there's a pretty strong negative relationship here. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the estimated detection probability for a low stem density, mid stem density, and high stem density site. So the, uh, the low density site is this blue line. You can see that detection probability doesn't fall off nearly as quickly as the uh, median value of 55 uh, or the highest value in green. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna skip over our availability. It, it uh, was not particularly informative other than to help reduce the variability in our other processes and did support generally our uh, conclusions or our hypotheses about um, time availability and nutcrackers uh, maybe being absent during some of our surveys. Uh, I do have that information queued up later though, if anyone has questions about it, but I wanna focus more on our nutcracker of abundance. So uh, the first thing you can see here is uh, from left to right, we have Douglas fir, Engelman spruce and gold, uh, limber pine and a, I guess that's a green, lodgepole in blue, and then white bark in purple. And you can clearly see that across all three periods, white bark had a higher estimated abundance than our other four uh, conifer uh, forest types. And uh, additionally, None of these other four forest types seem to differ appreciably from 
any of the others. Uh, the other thing you can really pick out from this is that between our harvesting periods, there is a, a weak but present signal that uh, mid-harvesting had possibly our highest estimated abundance and early harvesting had our lowest estimated abundance. There's clearly some overlap between those 95% confidence intervals though. So I wouldn't consider this to be a really strong relationship, but it's something that maybe we want to uh, continue to look at in the future and to study. Um, <clears throat> so this was interesting to me personally because uh, what we found was really white bark seemed to be the end all and be all for our, our birds during the time we were out surveying. Uh, you, can, you can clearly see that white bark is just above and beyond the other four conifer species here, suggesting that maybe during that time, there weren't many alternative seed resources being used aside from white bark, which we know to be an important seed resource for nutcrackers. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, there's variability in their seed resource use. Uh, and this maybe has some implications for uh, there not being alternative seed resources that we observed. Of course, nutcracker behaviors uh, could be very flexible and it could be that in future years, they do use alternative seed resources, but uh, at least during the time we were there, it seems that white bark was really the, the main seed resource. So uh, to wrap things up for this section, uh, nutcracker abundance was highest in white bark forest communities overall. There was a small increase in nutcracker density during that mid harvesting season, although I wouldn't consider it to be a very strong signal. As I mentioned, there was a, another competitive model that did not have that same uh, uh, harvesting season term included. And that model was, was very close in information criteria. So um, maybe something that needs further investigation. Uh, additionally, we did see a fair number of seed harvesting observations in white bark and limber pine. Although overall limber pine just did not have the same uh, level of abundance as white bark did. <clears throat> So uh, to kind of circle back to this, this uh, lit review image that I showed you earlier, uh, clearly in other regions, there are multiple seed resources that nutcrackers are, are known to use or may use regularly uh, or may use irregularly depending on availability of their preferred species. But at least during the time we were in Yellowstone, white bark was really the, the main uh, seed resource. And so uh, its importance might be greater in circumstances like this, and can, its continued uh, production of seeds might be more important for nutcrackers, given that there may not, uh, or at least that we didn't have any uh, really, um, really strong evidence of alternative seed resources. Okay, so as I mentioned, I have a, a third section here, and I'm going to give you a sort of brief uh, overview of our power analysis that we conducted for long-term nutcracker monitoring based off of our study design that I just showed you. Okay, and I'm running short on time, so I'm going to uh, try and get through this fairly fairly quickly. So uh, to give a quick background on statistical power, I'm going to go back to undergrad biostats here and show you a null hypothesis testing uh, table. And this sort of highlights the idea that uh, there are ways you can make correct statistical conclusions, and there are ways that you can make what are called statistical errors. So there's type one and type two errors. I am going to focus on this right hand column under alternative hypothesis is true. And particularly 
the probability of coming to the correct conclusion from your analysis versus making what we call a type two error. Uh, essentially, that would be where there is some kind of ecological effect, but we failed to detect it for some reason. So what's the probability of uh, detecting that effect given that it really is there? Uh, that is what we call statistical power. And uh, what we sought to do was to estimate the statistical power of a long-term monitoring study uh, to detect a decline in nutcrackers over the course of up to about 20 years. Um, to do this, we had to specify a few things. So we started by specifying a uh, decline that we were interested in detecting. And we put out two particular scenarios, a 2.5 and a 5% decline annually over the course of this, uh, this monitoring. Um, and I believe this, this sub note about a 30% reduction over 10 years relates to the IUCN listing criteria. Um, although I'd need to sort of backtrack and double check that, but that's uh, just meant to be a baseline for what other, uh, other organizations have used as their criteria. So in addition to specifying what we call an effect, which is that level of decline, we also have to specify a sample size. So 30, 40, or 60 surveys per year. Uh, of course, that effect size is what we call that decline. And then we need to specify an alpha value, which relates to the sensitivity of our, uh, our design to detect that decline. We went with a uh, generally accepted 5% or 0 0.05 uh, as our alpha value in this situation. So that relates uh, to a uh, p-value below 0.05, or conversely, a 95% confidence interval. <clears throat> so to give you a bit of background on this, uh, there are three papers that have made major contributions to the topic of um, estimating wildlife abundance from repeated counts over time. These have all come out since uh, 2010. And they've really pushed the framework for uh, analysis of these types of data. So Dale and Madsen had a, uh, a paper where they, uh, they postulated a statistical model using simple count data to estimate uh, some population parameters, including population trends over time. Then Hostetler and Chandler took their framework, produced uh, a fair bit of statistical code for it, and also uh, generalized its applicability to not only uh, density independent trends, but also uh, some cases of density dependence, like a logistic uh, curve. And then finally, Solman et al. took the same framework and actually uh, applied it to a distance sampling uh, study design like what we uh, did with nutcrackers in that previous section. So we actually uh, used the resources that several of these papers produced and wrote some of our own code to uh, uh, perform a simulation-based long-term monitoring power analysis. <clears throat> As kind of a, a dive into population change over time, uh, really a population trend comes from differences over time in the population estimate, as you can see in orange here on the right-hand side. And that population is subject to uh, changes from uh, animal recruitment and animal survival, which relate back to these really fundamental births, immigrations, emigrations, and deaths uh, processes that we can estimate individually. Uh, 
because of the data we have available, we're going to focus more on recruitment and survival and how an imbalance in these across years can result in that uh, decline over time. <clears throat> so uh, you can see the equation that kind of produces new values in each subsequent year at the top here. This is a pretty dense slide, and I'm just going to uh, briefly talk about how uh, we took our uh, estimated nutcracker densities from that previous section and applied them as predicted abundances for our first time period in this simulation process. And then from there, uh, we had a 5% decline with what we call a Markovian uh, linkage between years, uh, which actually produced uh, declining values that were related to the previous year's value. So <clears throat> I'm gonna start by showing you what an annual trend looks like. Here you can see that a 5% decline in the solid line results after 20 years in only about 40% uh, of the population remaining. And a 2.5% decline after 20 years results in, I think that's uh, roughly 60% of the population remaining. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, the overall decline and what that magnitude of loss would look like. Uh, to assess our performance, our model performance, we calculated some uh, confidence interval coverage estimates, as well as the total bias. So I'm only showing you these for the 2.5% decline. Uh, for coverage, we would hope that about 95% of our confidence intervals did overlap that true value. We found that it was uh, routinely a little bit higher. So these were a little bit conservative. And then for bias, we did find that there was a slight positive bias in our estimated uh, trend in population. Uh, this was consistent with what uh, Hostetler and Chandler also found in their simulations, as well as what's been seen in other places. And it likely relates to some of the processes such as uh, immigration and emigration that are more difficult to fully map into your simulation or require a little more complexity. Overall, though, that total bias was not found to be very, very high. Uh, so we do have relative confidence in, in the results so far. Uh, and then as far as our actual power goes, here's, here's the, the, real, um, the real results that we want to get to, right? Uh, we found that with uh, a 5% decline, we were able to to, uh, to reach an adequate level of power, which was about 80%. This is typically found or accepted as uh, adequate power for a study. Uh, after uh, at least 10 years in all cases, with 30 surveys per year, it took 17 years approximately. With 40 surveys per year, we reached adequate power after about 15 years. And then with 60 surveys per year, it took about 11 years to reach that 80% power threshold. That is to say, in four out of five sort of repeated cases, we would successfully detect that 5% decline. <clears throat> For the 2.5% decline, however, uh, in none of our cases did we reach an adequate power threshold of 80% after 20 years. So what this suggests is that if a decline is 2.5%, uh, is uh, we would need longer than 20 years in order to detect that decline. So um, uh, sort of mixed results here. <clears throat> so on the plus side, we were able to recover that decline with adequate power in a 5% scenario although that may be in fact a, a very steep decline. Um, however, with a 2.5% decline, which is, uh, which is less severe, we were not able to recover that. Uh, 
I want to sort of broaden this back out and talk about a couple final uh, points. So long-term monitoring doesn't have to only serve one goal. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's probably beneficial that it serves multiple goals simultaneously. So in, uh, in this case, well, we were particularly focused on nutcracker population declines, there are lots of other ecological questions that would really benefit us uh, in terms of management and conservation that we can ask using a similar or even just slightly tweaked study design. Uh, situations uh, my, that might result, or uh, sorry. Um, so uh, questions about the relationship between uh, white bark, uh, uh, tree, uh, white bark cone crops annually and nutcracker abundance. For instance, on the right here, you can see uh, a bar chart from the grizzly bear investigations report showing uh, some peak years and uh, also some very, very low years. So one thing we could ask about is um, how do mean cones per tree for white bark relate to nutcracker abundance, as well as a whole suite of other important uh, questions. Uh, additionally, I do want to uh, highlight this. Uh, this is a workflow that could be adapted to nearly any uh, long-term monitoring situation or planning, uh, planning process. So uh, this is a, a very adaptable um, analysis that could be conducted. And it's, it's especially important for uh, conservation biologists and land managers in determining how they want to uh, plan out their studies that they may be uh, thinking of, of uh, conducting in the future. Um, so yeah, I think with that, I do wanna end here. We are uh, getting fairly close to time, or I guess we've gone a little over, so I apologize for that. And uh, again, here are my acknowledgments. And I will stop sharing. So thanks for thanks for listening in. Thanks, Tommy. That was a great talk. Um, we have some questions um, from folks here. We're we're at um, 1:02 p.m., so we understand if um, if you need to get going or if anyone else needs to get going. Um, do you have time to stay and answer questions, or what are you thinking? I absolutely do. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And again, apologies to anyone who uh, I pushed their time a little bit over. It's okay. Let's see. Um, um, if you want to raise your hands, um, we can enable you to ask your question aloud. Um, but we also have a few questions in the chat. I think Diana answered some of those. Um, Laurel, if you don't mind, uh, I could ask a quick question. Great. Uh, hey, Tommy, this is Vlad. Uh, awesome talk. I really enjoyed uh, all the info and your analysis. I think that power analysis is definitely really uh, useful for management. Um, but to ask you a uh, less broad and more nitpicky question about point counts, um, just wondering, did you have any uh, way of differentiating uh, your point count data between when birds were simply flying through the ecosystem uh, rather than perching or actually visibly using uh, that area? Yeah, thanks, Vlad. I really appreciate that. And that is a, that is an excellent question, which I, I didn't spend uh, time on. So yes, we we did differentiate between what we might call a flyover, where a bird uh, was thought not to be using that habitat, and a bird that was maybe perched or moving through the habitat that uh, was clearly using that that location or that study site. Yeah, so that is that is absolutely an important distinction to make because. Uh, as birds are highly mobile, uh, it's, it's uh, maybe not as informative to see a bird flying over, 
but seeing them actually use that habitat is much more, uh, you can be much more certain that they are in fact using it for uh, some, some end. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thanks. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions related to um, the type of their foraging preferences. Um, so there's a question about why they don't eat lodgepole pine seeds from Diana, Diane Shirley. Um, and then also a question from Brian Smithers um, about why, why don't you think uh, nutcrackers aren't targeting limber pine more um, as opposed to white bark? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, those are both fantastic questions. So in regards to lodgepole, uh, we did have uh, data that we collected on their behavioral observations and in particular, any, any foraging that nutcrackers were doing or caching during our, during our surveys was recorded. Um, we did actually, uh, see some some nutcrackers using lodgepole particularly in 20 in our last year which was 2021 um we i think we had three or four uh observations of nutcrackers using lodgepole um so those occurred during times that uh were not what we maybe consider peak ripeness so there may not have been um uh, there may just not have been alternative seed, or a primary or preferred seed resources available to them at the time. Um, but as, as I think I, I had in one of my slides, the energy content of a lodgepole seed is, is uh, quite a bit lower than what we see in a, a white bark or a limber pine seed. So that um, may also have something to do with it. Uh, just being a little more work for them for, for that same energy level. Uh, in terms of limber pine, that is a really great question. We absolutely saw quite a few nutcrackers in some of our limber pine sites, um, and they were absolutely using limber pine seeds to a, a certain extent, but uh, when we uh, estimated their abundance, it was... Uh, quite a bit lower um, than what might be suggested by our, our raw data. And that's simply, I think, related to uh, our, our observers detecting almost all of the birds in limber pine. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of one of our limber pine sites, but they're very open uh, in structure, uh, few trees, uh, that are sort of widely dispersed. And so it's really easy to see everything that nutcrackers are doing in that habitat. Um, so while we may have some observations of, of them using that, it just may not have been at the same level as we estimated to be in white bar. Excellent, thank you, Tommy. Um, Chris Clark, asked whether um, you could do a power analysis to detect an increase in population um, as well as a decline. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's a really great question and you absolutely can do something like that. Um, the code that we uh, wrote would be really easy to adjust to look at situations where maybe birds are increasing in numbers rather than declining. We selected a decline um, primarily because that was of interest from a conservation perspective. Um, but if, if you suspect that maybe your species of interest is increasing in numbers and that's, that's something that you need information on, uh, it, would, it would certainly be, um, a pretty pretty small change to look at, at an increase rather than a decline. Excellent, thank you. Let's see. Um, okay, 
Yeah, uh, so John Burley asked, um, do you have information on what the minimum um, relative abundance of white bark pine or limber pine um, is required or distance from other stands is required for a stand to be used by nutcrackers? So minimum abundance or proximity to. Oop, I think you muted. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Uh, unfortunately, we we don't have any hard numbers about that at the moment. Um, there are, I think, some, maybe some previous studies that might uh, that might relate to that, but our work uh, didn't really. I wouldn't say we got at that specifically. Uh, we weren't we weren't really looking at at distances to uh, other seed resources in this case. Unfortunately, that seems like very important information, though, and definitely something that um, that could be useful. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. We have a question um, as to whether you've your existing design stratified by elevation zone, um, or if you have. Um, any documentation of the impacts of wind speed and climate condition conditions during your observations? Yeah, uh, we did not stratify by elevation. Um, we do have that data for each of our sites, but uh, that wasn't a, a variable we stratified on. Uh, it's potentially something you could use as a predictor variable. That'd be that'd be an interesting uh, an interesting process. I'd be really interested to see what that looks like. Um, and then as far as, uh, uh, let's see, precipitation and wind, we did not survey when uh, there were, when there was precipitation. Um, if winds were high, we also did not survey. So we really, we tried to maintain um, consistent weather conditions for each of our, our surveys. Yeah, and if conditions got bad during a survey, we paused and either waited for the survey to, uh, or the weather to, you know, uh, alleviate, or we ended the survey at that point. Excellent, um, great answer. Um, so this is a, a similar kind of a question. Um, you know, you're, you did such fine work, people want to see more from you, is what I'm getting from this. Um, Tio is asking if you have an estimate on how many of the whitebark pine seeds cached remain unretrieved. Oh, uh, <laughs> I know that uh, Diana Tomback has done some, uh, some important work on that. Unfortunately, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, and that, um, that wasn't something we were looking at directly. Uh, but I do think she has uh, she has some work that she's published on that, um, maybe in uh, her uh, 2001 book. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, Libby Pansing did a study for her master's on um, seed pilferage and white bark pine seed caches as well. Um, so I can direct her to that um, in a minute here. Let's see if we have any more questions. Um, limber pine cone production varies so much over more years than the period of your study. Um, the higher abundance years could have been missed. Um, I'm thinking that I think you had a slide showing the abundance of cone production. For limber pine specifically? Yes. Uh, yeah, I can I can pull that up if if there's uh, curiosity. We did yeah we did see a, quite a bit of variation with 2019 having almost no cones per tree, and then the other two years having uh, an estimated 100 or 200 cones per tree in some cases um, with uh, a fairly wide confidence intervals too. So those estimates were not were not extremely precise, but there was definitely a bit of variation. But I mean, over the course of three years, the, there's, a, there's a lot of that, um, that uh, masting cycle that you're not going to pick up. And so I, I agree that uh, having that long, longer term data would be really exciting. 
uh, in terms of relating nutcracker abundance to those differing cycles and the energy availability uh, at our sites. So I fully agree that longer uh, a longer term data set would be fantastic. <laughs> Good answer. Um, and uh, my understanding is that this project is, is going to continue the Nutcracker monitoring. So maybe that data will be available in the future, which is really cool. Um, other questions from folks? Does anybody have some more questions for Tom? Tom? Thank you so much for your talk. Excellent, excellent work. Um, thank you for coming. And um, once again, I, so I put the YouTube link in the chat. We'll have a recording of this talk as well as previous talks. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from uh, Cindy Smith and Brenda Shepard next month. Thanks everyone. <laughs>